What naturally follows on next is to ask you then about big society. What's your understanding of big society and, and the implications of that for participation? Well, it's not new, is it? I mean, anybody who's involved in the cultural sector will have worked with volunteers and will have known that people who aren't paid by the sector and then they're living through the sector have a lot to offer. And they're uh, going to any cultural institution, going to any amateur dramatics, go into any library and see a mother and toddlers group, go into any museum that is running a local history week or a local history month, go into any art gallery that actually sees paintings of local contexts, and you understand that the public have a role to play in their community. So like, hang on, we drive this. We don't need politicians to tell us what big society means. You've been living it for ages. How many museums can you think of in the next 10 seconds that were born in response to a local need? How many libraries have reorganised themselves because the public demanded it or asked it of them? Now, that's what big society is. So don't be frightened of that. It's a politician's label for the best that society can actually be. But I tell you what I think is really important, that big society does not mean, in my view, that there's no room for professionalism. It doesn't mean that. And all the professional skills that will be in this audience at this conference are still needed. It is not a takeover of the amateurs or by the amateurs of the professionals of local things and ignoring national things. I think the big challenge about, or the big challenge about the big society, if you like, is to somehow bring the best of the professional and the knowledgeable sector with what volunteers bring to the table. And if you can make something of that, and if you can have a dialogue, you've done it, you've worked it. But it's not either or. I think it's a reminder to professionals that the public have got something to say. And to be honest, nothing more than that. So that's really the big challenge, isn't it, in terms of participation, is to be reacting and listening and acting on public expectations, as well as making sure that, that there isn't de-skilling, that participation and volunteering is supported professionally. I think that's right. If you look back in the cultural sector, and I think it's worth doing this now, and again, I often do it politically, but I think you can do it culturally as well. If, 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 you, if you go back 100, 120, 150 years, and look, so let me just put it for, you know, at some of the working class cultural institutions. If you looked at the, the band that every miners lodge had, if you looked at the artwork and the, the creative work that women, and it would have been women, did in their groups, if you looked at the poetry that the Workers' Education Association actually brought about, if you listened to the singing and saw the choirs, they were cultural institutions created by people without a degree between them, a bit without a qualification to their name. Was it bad? No. Was it worthless? No. Was it good? Yes. It was brilliant. But society's changed and those things now are so often done more by people with training and with qualifications and that is good. But that little look back reminds us that people without qualifications have something to offer but they are better and more is brought off the, out of them and their contribution can be better because they work with people who've got professional training. I'm absolutely committed to the marriage between the two. And if that's what the big society is, which I believe it is, it's probably a force for good. Thank you. Very, very helpful, I think, for everybody wanting to participate in this debate about big society and the impact for diversity and participation. Um, to lead on from that, you said in your review that the words that connected the cultural sectors included audiences, engagement, social impact, outreach work, working with young people, diversity, identity. These are all words that sum up a vision for delivering equalities and diversity. How do you think in this current climate can we work together for these goals across the cultural sectors, maybe with new partnerships, new collaborations? You know, sometimes the dividing lines we make within the sector because we have to do that organisationally don't make sense to the people outside. And I, I'm not against making dividing lines and organisational bundles. I think that's important. But those bundles can restrict our creativity if we're not careful. 
I think if you look at that question from a citizen's point of view, or from a child's or a parent's or from any of us, we know something in our lives, whether it be in our own spirit, in our own mind, or whether it be in our family or our community, or our country or our world, that relates to the cultural sector about imagination, knowing our roots, a sense of place, a sense of identity, a sense of fulfillment, things we need to do to feel good about ourselves, singing, dancing, enjoying, all those things, that area of study. We know that they're important to us and we can't imagine a life without them. We know also that society isn't very good at valuing them and cher cherishing them because they can't weigh them and measuring them. So my first message about that would be, remember that bit of our being is actually very important. The public understands it and the public often puts it in one bundle, not in lots of separate bundle. It's the bundle that's not work, the bundle that's not the exam, the bundle that's not homework if you're a child. So sometimes people see it as a whole. But more seriously, I think for the sector, I think about capacity. These are difficult times. And the more we can work together across the different parts of the cultural sector, I think the better. And the more we can learn from each other and share, the better. But also think about the opportunities that that brings us. You think about library as the place for theater. If you think about museums as a place for reading, you think about schools as an opportunity for national museums to share their treasured objects. I think the best of the cultural sector in terms of its ability to create and imagine can actually reach a new point. So I think the trick at the moment is to be confident, know that the role we play in people's lives is absolutely immeasurable, but absolutely vital. And we're not human beings or a society or a civilization without it. Don't be frightened of the challenges that are ahead, but know that we have the creativity to meet them and stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before us. And just remember that, you know, I don't know how many recessions we've had in past decades. I don't know how many crises we've had in the world in which we live, but culture has survived them all. And in a way, we're the guardians of making sure that culture survives the one that faces us, but is very, very able to do so because of the strength of the sector as we go to the next stage of the journey. Thank you very much, Estelle, for sharing your views with us and giving us some optimism for the future of working together, collaborating, finding ways to bring out the best in individuals and communities and to find a way forward. Thank, Thank you. you. Hope the conference goes really well and people enjoy it.